Hello, this is Juliana Donald. You may remember me from Deep Space Nine and The Next Generation, and you're listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. Today's guest is an actress who has appeared in many high-profile films and TV shows, and I'm happy to say she is also the first person we've had on the show who is just one degree of separation not only from Patrick Stewart, Angela Lansbury, but also Kermit the Frog. That person is Juliana Donald, and she has been in a ton of things to say the least. Juliana appeared on the third season episode of TNG titled A Matter of Perspective and made her second appearance in the Trek franchise in the third season episode of Deep Space Nine called Profit Motive, both times playing alien characters. She put on the Starfleet uniform in her last Star Trek appearance, which is a very unique one as she played Lieutenant Shoram in the interactive video game Star Trek Borg. This is the first time on this show we've gotten to talk about that bizarre game, and she has a lot to say about that. Aside from Star Trek, Juliana got her start in Muppets Take Manhattan, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, and followed it up with roles on Murder, She Wrote, The X-Files, NYPD Blue, Superboy, Major Dad, Walker, Texas Ranger, Touched by an Angel, Murder One, Monk, and a whole lot more. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, and I think you're going to enjoy hearing all the stories that Juliana has to tell about working on many of these shows. These days, Juliana has stepped away from acting, but she has a new creative outlet that we're also going to discuss towards the end of the episode. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Trek Untold. All one word, no spaces. If you want to check out some of our Trek Untold merchandise, you can also do that on our Teespring store, which you can find on teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold, where we've got shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, tote bags, and all sorts of other things available to proudly display how much you like this podcast. If you're having trouble finding the link, just check us out again on social media, and you'll see us posting about it from time to time there as well. You can also support our show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold. If you're already following us or offering us your support, thank you for your help. Most of all, if you can't support us financially, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. This helps more people find out about the show and helps spread awareness of Trek Untold. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our friends at Triple Fiction Productions, who make some great 3D printed Star Trek inspired products for toys and people, but you'll hear more about them a little bit later on. Now, without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Affirmative. Initiating program. And welcome back to Trek Untold, and joining me now on the other side of the line, you may remember her from her two appearances in Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, but she's been in a ton of other stuff that we're going to talk about today, as well as Trek, of course. That person is Juliana Donald. Miss Donald, how are you today? I am A-OK. How about yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm glad we could connect, and uh, we got a lot to talk about because you have had quite a prolific career. Me too. So let's start off with the first question I like to ask all my guests. And that is, what is your earliest memory of Star Trek? My earliest memory of Star Trek was when I was a kid and um, my both my parents worked. So we would come back from school. We walked to school and my brother and myself and my sister and we would come back. And my brother was totally obsessed with Star Trek. So it was like a non-question when you came in. But this we're talking about the um, William Shatner Star Trek. Yep. And so I just remember Star Trek from a kid and and having to watch the episodes thousands of times with my brother. <laughs> That's not too bad. So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood. Where did you grow up? Who were your parents and what did they do? And what did you want to do when you grew up? Um, all I wanted to be was a ballerina. And um, my parents, my father is, uh, was worked for the State Department in the Organization of American States. He was a Latin American scholar and he uh headed disaster relief for South American and Latin American countries. My mother was a teacher and um, she was, both parents have PhDs. And my mother passed away at young, like at, in her fifties, 30 years ago. So, um, you know, that's unfortunate, but my father is still alive and he's turning 91 this year, which is pretty amazing. Oh yeah, congratulations. um, Yeah. 
And so my childhood, I spent the first five years of my life in Brazil. Then my parents moved to D the D.C. area because of, um, and I was in Brazil because of my father's work. And then they moved to the Washington, D.C. area where uh, my father got a job in Washington, D.C. We actually were living in Northern Virginia, McLean, Virginia. And um, basically, um, I was obsessed with ballet and I went to a, I didn't have kind of a normal childhood. I went to a ballet school, which was similar to a professional children's school where it was ballet and academics. It was called the Academy of the Washington Ballet. And um, that was like kind of my education where we ha would have um, classes from I think eight to 12 every day. And then we'd have an hour lunch and then we'd dance until seven or eight at night and perform. And it was kind of uh, different. You know, I didn't have the normal um, prom and all those things that regular people had. I had this kind of, um, I don't know, cloistered, I guess, um, experience. And then I was dancing in New York. Um, I started, I got an agent and I went on like a few commercial auditions and I got a commercial and I made back in the old days, you could make a lot of money on commercials. You can't anymore. And I think at the time I made like $25,000, which probably now would be the equivalent of like $200,000. So it was like, I couldn't believe it. And, um, so I started, I kind of fell into acting. I started acting and, and, um, I got a movie, uh, my first kind of, theatrical job was um, on film was a movie called The Muppets Take Manhattan. Yeah, and, one of my favorites. Uh, and I was doing a lot of theater. I was doing a lot of like off Broadway and off, off Broadway and off, off, off Broadway. And um, so I was kind of working my way up until I got to off Broadway. So that was, and then I got a job. I came out to Los Angeles and I kind of fell in love with the weather and the lifestyle and I ended up staying here. So I've been in LA for a long time. All right, very cool. So let's t take a little trip back to New York, back when you were first getting your start in things. Mm -hmm. uh, did you continue your education in performing while you were in New York, or was it just basically straight to the theater, straight to having actual professional gigs? No, I I was taking, I was studying with Stella Adler and um, Herbert Berghoff Studio, and I was because when you're a dancer, you even if you're a professional, you take class every day. So I just kind of felt like I should be taking class. So I was still taking ballet classes for exercise and I was taking acting classes for acting but I found that I was getting a lot more experience by doing plays and being on stage so I ended up um, kind of focusing more on that which that became my education you know uh, hours a day of rehearsals and that kind of thing and in those days um, you went on lots and lots and lots of auditions and um, they didn't have, you know, tape yourself. Now they, now it's all tape yourself. We'll see if we, we like how you look, whatever. Back then it was this like audition for everything. And a lot of times that's kind of a great thing because a lot of times you would not be what they were thinking of, but you would come in and your audition would be such that they would give you the job. So it's very different now. So you mentioned that your first on-screen role was in Muppets Take Manhattan. That's from 1984. Uh, yes. And you played Jenny. So, yes. uh, you know, tell us, I guess, really the first big thing is it's different to go on like a commercial production versus a film set. And I imagine, again, uh -huh. coming from mostly theater, it's got to be a bit of a shock. Uh, what do you remember from your very first day on your very first set, essentially, of being on a movie? Well, the people, um, puppeteers are not like normal performers. <laughs> That's what I've they're heard. Really, they're really kind of a special breed. And um, they're really doing this for love. And, you know, a lot of performers are kind of jaded by they want to make so much money or they want to do this, but they're completely a different breed. And um, they were all, they all knew each other from Jim Henson started the Muppets in Baltimore. And all these people were from Baltimore or sometimes people would travel from, oh God, I can't remember his name, who played Rizzo the Rat. Um, they would travel from um, like, anywhere in America and they would come and they would meet Jim. And if he liked them and thought they were talented, he would give them a job. He wouldn't care that they weren't on, that they hadn't done a million, you know, they didn't have a million credits or whatever. He would just give people jobs. So um, the first thing I was struck by was the people. 
and also um, the fact that the entire set was built three feet off the ground. Mm. So um, so the puppeteers were like inside of it. It was like you have to imagine a floor where you take the floor out, pieces of the floor out, and um, down, you know, six feet down or whatever, or uh, are a bunch of men standing there and they had um, they had monitors around their head with a TV and we're talking like you know years ago when they did not have things that were light and whatever and they would just basically not even look at you they were just looking at the monitor to watch the puppet respond to you and the puppet talk to you and the puppet do that to you so I was kind of really impressed by how they worked. I was really impressed by how friendly they were. I was really impressed by um, the whole thing. It was just, it had never been on a set like that then or after that was so kind of like you were with your family and not like you were on a professional project. I imagine it still has got to be kind of weird to be acting with puppets, essentially. I know you got to do some scenes with Lonnie Price and many other right. actual actors, but uh, you know, how do you emote when you're basically talking to someone's hand? I know that's kind of it's kind of um, weird the first time I did that, um, but I guess it's kind of like talking to an animal that maybe not they might not be like totally focused looking into your eyes when you're looking into their eyes, and it was similar to that and or a little kid or something that's not you know focused. It was a little difficult, but as easy as it could be, they made it easy. I mean they they kind of they all had the voices and everything. So you could kind of, you kind of had to suspend belief. And then, um, and that's kind of how I got through it. So not long after Muppets Take Manhattan, you went on to do the Purple Rose of Cairo, which was the Woody Allen directed film with Mia Farrow, Jeff Daniels, and Danny Aiello, which is a heck of a cast to be around. Uh, what was yeah. that experience like? Totally different. Um, Woody Allen is not, um, Woody Allen is not super friendly. Um, Whereas, you know, Jim Henson was, if we were in Central Park and there was little kids there, even though he had an assistant saying, you know, like he had 5,000 meetings, including like the president of the United States or something, he would just ignore everything and just connect with the children. And that was a really, really beautiful thing to say, to see. And he did not have any, um, I want to say any affect or pretense or anything was so humble. So Woody Allen was, um, Woody Allen was, um, or is, I should say, there's all these rules when you work for him, even when I auditioned for it and, you know, I met him and everything and they said, you got the job. And I said, um, what am I doing? And they said, oh, this is a Woody Allen movie. You don't ask that question. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, I went to the, the set and, um, I had no idea until I got into my costume that I was playing an usherette. I had no idea. You're, there's so many rules, like you're told, whereas, you know, the, the Muppets were, it was like being with a family and everything was okay. And and I, and I funnily, the, um, the main extras that were there every single day were Martin Scorsese's mother and father, who apparently loved doing extra work or did, loved doing extra work. And um, Martin would always ask them if they wanted a job as an acting, and they said, absolutely not. They'd only want to be extras. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so they were like that. And then Woody was like, you were told all these rules. Don't look at him. Don't talk to him. Don't shake his hand. Don't say hello. Don't say thank you. Don't whatever, all these things. So it was kind of really intimidating because, you know, there were so many rules. Also, you didn't have it. You had no idea what was going on. And they also were like, you know, there was days, I think I was on the set for like a month and I didn't even do anything. I was oh, just wow. sitting in a trailer wondering when I was going to work. That would not have happened on the Muppet. The Muppets, when you went in, you worked, you did your scenes, you left, you know, at normal hours and normal everything. But his, it was just like this endless long thing. And then at the end I was like, well, gee, I want to go thank him. And I had like five people grab my arm and say, do not do that. He hates that. So, um, so I found it kind of odd. He doesn't really direct. He, he just like, I guess he casts who he wants and, um, then who or who he thinks has the quality. And then you're just supposed to 
say the lines and um so it was kind of odd you know and um to work that way because you have no direction at all and they would just say okay action action i remember the first day that that i was actually on the set and they said action and then they they looked at me and i was like what am i supposed to do they hadn't even given me the lines and i then all of a sudden they said cut and they said it's your line and i said what line and then they ran and got the script supervisor ran and got a a, a straight edge razor and razored out the, my line and handed it to me and said here so you're not given anything like what your background is where you're coming from nothing it's just you know um here's your line say your line and um so it was really difficult and I mean, Michael Keaton was originally hired to play the Jeff Daniels part, and I guess he wanted to work like a lot of actors do, which is, you know, do you want me to do it this way or do you want me to do it that way? And Woody Allen couldn't stand that, so he fired him and uh -huh. hired Jack, uh, Jeff Daniels, who didn't ask any questions or say anything, who just said the lines, and, you know, that was that. So um, it was just kind of, you know, I love the movie. I love Mia. Uh, Mia Farrow, she was just absolutely wonderful, and um, she was always doing stuff for her kids, and she was such a wonderful person. But I, um, you know, I, it, I didn't feel particularly close with him because he was just not, you know, there was just so many people around him that were, you know, cloistering him and just you couldn't get through. So it was just, it was kind of a difficult job. Yeah, I've heard similar things about working with Woody as well on that side of things, so that's unfortunate, mm -hmm. but... You know, just to follow up that, and on the other side of the spectrum here, just to talk about Muppets again, uh, the movie you were in was directed by Frank Oz, who's done so many amazing things. That must have been just a polar opposite experience to work with him, wasn't it? Yeah, totally opposite. He was very much, um, very much wanted to direct. He very much had his, a vision of how he wanted it to be done. Everything was like set. It was just like completely different. And, you know, so, so that was in a way great for me for my first job because... I had this like amazing group of people to work with and I worked for like, I think about, it took about four months. Normally the Muppet movies take about six months to a year to film because of all the um, special effects stuff. But this one took four. So, and they had, a, they got a real, they got a real minister to marry Miss Piggy and Kermit. <laughs> so they are officially married. Yes. Yes. <laughs> they are officially married. All right, well, thank you for clarifying that, because that's really why we do this podcast, is to confirm whether or not Muppets have been married. Yes, they were really married. There was It was a real, they were very, you know, insistent on getting somebody who was an actual, you know, uh, minister who could give them a real marriage. So <laughs> That's awesome. So outside of this also, uh, you had done a lot of voiceover work in anime cartoons, which I found kind of interesting. And you worked on some pretty big things, like uh, the Lupin the Third film uh, that was directed right. by Hayao Miyazaki. Silent right. Mobius, Dirty Pair. Uh, how right. did you get into VO work? Um, I, you know, I didn't really ever pursue voiceover work, but this, um, somebody, they asked me to do, whenever they asked me to do auditions, I was fine. You know, sure, I'll do, I don't care what the work is. And they asked me to do, they called up and said they have this audition they want me to do for this Japanese, um, they didn't tell me who it was, thank God, because I probably would have been completely intimidated. And um, so I went into the audition and I guess they, they asked me to do a bunch of different characters. And so they were very happy with me. So the next thing I know, I got called to do the job and then, you know, my name got passed to somebody else. And so I was getting all these, you know, people requesting me um, to play certain characters in um, the movie. So it was kind of great because working with, you know, amazing directors, so. Yeah, and we talked to uh, Iona Morris, who was also on Star Trek and has done many, many other things, and one of the things that she did through her career was also voiceover work in a lot of animes from the 80s, and, uh, you know, she talked to us a little about looping. Um, so mm -hmm. did you have to do a lot of that when you were working, and how did you find it? It's a little bit tricky because, you know, you're sitting there listening to the conversation, and then right before you're supposed to talk, you hear beep, 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 and on the third one, you have to speak. So, you know, inevitably you might not, you're like trying to watch the, the thing and trying to listen to the beeps and trying to figure out, you know, trying to do the character how it is. So it's a little bit challenging and, but you know, it's not as hard as I think it looks. It's just, um, or as it seems, it's kind of, you know, because they have people there in the sound booth and they will say, okay, can you do it again? Can you speed up here? Can you do this? Or can you slow down or whatever? 
so you're kind of being directed as you go. If they like something, they'll move to the next thing. But, you know, I didn't find it to be the Japanese thing was a little bit difficult because you're having to loop Japanese voices over Japanese voices. And that was um, you didn't know if they were saying, oh, really? And you were just saying, really, you know, at the wrong time or whatever. So it was that was tricky. But um, it you know, it's not. I found that I did one time I did looping for a friend's movie, which was uh, people do this background looping. I don't know what they call it. And um, and that was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. That was, you know, in a big studio and they were bringing people, you know, OK, we need street street sounds. OK, we need this. and We need that, need that. And you just had to run in and start doing this. And it was like um, it was it just kind like total of chaos. Yeah, it was total chaos. It was crazy. So that I found hard. I don't I didn't really find it to be difficult to do individual things. So before we start talking about Star Trek, there is one other show that we're obsessed with here on Trek Untold. That Uh might surprise you, but uh, you were in an episode of Murder, She Wrote, and we're kind of obsessed with that. Uh, Yes. So you were in season five. The episode is Fireburn, Cauldron Bubble. Uh, Do you have an Angela Lansbury story you can share with us? Well, you know, I did a, I don't know if, I mean, no one saw this unless you were like 90 years old at the time. I did this spinoff of Murder, She Wrote called The Law and Harry McGraw. I was one of the leads on that. And it was the same producers as um, the Murder, She Wrote, the same creators and producers. And Angela Lansbury is fantastic. She's absolutely wonderful. The producers are absolutely wonderful. She's like such a pro. She's really lovely. She just, I mean, she's not at all, not one drop of ego. And she was just like, I never saw her get upset ever. I never saw her even get irritated. I never saw her acting like I need water. I need, you know, anything. She was just, you know, so down to earth. And I don't know if that's because her background is in England where actors are kind of a different looked upon differently than they are in the u.s but that was it was great it was great to work on that so the episode of murder she wrote that you were in also had a pretty stellar guest cast list it had roddy mcdowell bill maher d wallace and brad Dourif. and i don't know if you right. have to work with any or all of those but uh did you have a chance to interact with them or, or do anything with them on set d wallace i did also her husband was her husband who passed away but he um, unfortunately but at the time her husband was on there too um i can't remember what his name is she was really nice she just had a baby so she was like um she was constantly in her trailer because she was breastfeeding her baby um and i met bill maher in the makeup thing um i didn't really work with him and he was really nice and really smart and kind of it's kind of interesting his path because I think it fits him much better than you know going and doing guest stars on TV shows, and um, I didn't really get to interact with Roddy. I got to interact with Angela and with um, with uh, Dee Wallace, and she was she was very nice. I mean, I didn't she wasn't because she had was a new mom and she was with her baby all the time. She wasn't super um, like you know uh, interactive with everybody, but she was very nice. So. You can tell a lot by when people are in a makeup chair, what their personalities are like. And so she was always really friendly and really sweet and like exactly like the mom on, you know, um, E.T. That's great to hear. Yeah. So, Juliana, let's jump now into 1990. And that is your Star Trek The Next Generation appearance. You were in the episode Mm -hmm. A Matter of Perspective. So can you tell us how you got cast for the role? Um, I had auditioned a lot of times for Star Trek. They um, had a thing where... They would bring you in for auditions and if you and you know if they liked you then they would bring you for another audition i think i auditioned for them like five times and it was always you know you got to the audition and you were like oh my god how do i say this word you know you were always like oh you know because they always had these strange words oh that techno babble and uh, and yeah techno babble and um so that one i auditioned for and um i got it and it was I can't remember who the who the um, director was of it, but um, I worked with a lot of the cast. The main thing about that I remember is that I had no idea that in order to be that kind of an alien, that you have to sit in the makeup chair for four hours 
to get it on and sometimes four and a half hours to get it off because they can't just rip it off. It will rip your face off <laughs> and because um, it's glued on your face. And um, and it was a crazy week. I mean, we were working 20 hour days. I had got no sleep. I had what they call forced calls every day where they had to pay me extra money because they did not give me a 12 hour time turnaround from when they finished to when I needed to be there the next morning. And it was impossible to sleep because I had this huge head. So if I, if I tried to lie down, you know, it, the head, like if I tried to lie down, I couldn't sleep because of the head being too big. So it wouldn't really fit on anything. And it was uh. just, it was crazy. That was your first time wearing any heavy prosthetics, I imagine, for a role ever, right? Yes, yes, yes. The second time I did a Star Trek, I was kind of used to it, so it wasn't as traumatic the first time. It was like, <laughs> oh, my God. And also because we had so many long hours for the first Star Trek I did. Um, the yeah. hours were just, I've never been on a set that many hours. And I think it's because it takes so long to get the makeup on and, you, you know, the crew might come at seven, but you got to be there, you know, four hours before that. So the, the director that you were trying to think of, that was Cliff Bull. Uh, he directed Cliff a lot Bull, of Star Trek yeah. episodes. Mm -hmm. um, he had said that was one of the toughest episodes in particular to direct and shoot for really? many, many reasons. Uh, just because I guess all the continuity issues, they had to keep up with it. Uh, what do you right. remember about being directed by him and just having to deal with this crazy shoot schedule? Well, it was it was mainly I mean, I felt like he was he was not a nice guy. I felt like it was more like this whole logistical thing of how do we fit all these people in this scene and how do we, you know, in this, you know, in this little tiny space, how do we fit all these people in the scene? And a lot of it was just like, you know, walking to your mark and stopping and then walking to your mark. And then it was just all this technical stuff they were just constantly dealing with the whole time. And it was really, really long um, days. And Jonathan Frakes, he was, he's a really nice guy. And he was like always happy and always nice. Of course, he wasn't wearing the prosthetics, but. Um, <laughs> But the interesting thing about Star Trek is, I don't know, I'm sure you know this, but if you are an alien on Star Trek, that's great. Because that means you can do every Star Trek, new Star Trek, any new show, anything. You can come back as an alien and you could keep coming back as aliens. If they did five million Star Trek shows, you could come back five million times as an alien. If you show your face and you're not wearing prosthetics, you are never allowed to do another Star Trek ever. So they have a, they have like a rule, I guess, because they feel like they, people can't see who you are if you're wearing the prosthetics. If you are not wearing the prosthetics, then maybe it's something about, you know, it's not going to suspend disbelief because people are going to say, wait a minute, that was the person who was in this other thing playing a commander. And now, you know, she's playing uh, uh, an officer or whatever. And so they're really, they're really strict about that. I'm sure there's some listeners out there who can let us know if there's been any exception to the rules. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but that's, that's yeah. an interesting thing to note. And then I was going to be a regular on one of their shows, but I got a movie and the movie would not let me out. So I could not do it. And I don't remember what it was, but um, I was very upset by that. So oh, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props, or toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or a part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triple fiction productions. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. The 
If you find yourself listening to your favorite podcast and wondering what microphone they use or how they do their editing, or if you watch a YouTube video and you wonder what camera is that, or going one step further, if you're watching Twitch and you're wondering how your favorite Twitch streamer built their rig and if you can do the same, then Toys and Tech of the Trade is for you. Toys and Tech of the Trade is an interview series where we sit down with content creators, entrepreneurs, and discuss the gadgets and gear that they use to create their content and run their businesses. We use toys in a broad sense, meaning the stuff that just puts a smile on your face, whether it's action figures to something a little bit more complex like musical instruments, cars, you'd be surprised what people consider their toys. Toys and Tech of the Trade can be found on all major podcast providers, including iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and of course, Spotify. Feel free to visit us at RageWorksNetwork.com to check us out. We now return to Trek Untold. So you got to work with a lot of very well-known character actors in this episode, uh, which included Mark Margolis, Gina Hecht, mm-hmm. and Craig Richard Nelson. And as you mentioned, you also got to work with some of the main cast, including Jonathan right. Frakes, Patrick Stewart, Marina Sirtis, right. LeVar Burton. Uh, what do you recall about working with all those people? Uh, Jonathan is like a super, he's like mayor of the town. <laughs> like he's one of those people that comes in and he's just like, hey, everybody, how are you doing? He's really, really, really friendly. Um, Patrick Stewart was nice. But he didn't have that like effusive thing that Jonathan has. Um, he was very nice, but very, he was very professional. And um, and um, Mark was really good. He was. I mean, we were in scenes, all these scenes together. So uh, he was also very professional. And um, and then Lavar Burton. I didn't really talk to him that much. Um, so, but everybody seemed to be really kind of you know, they understood the drill. They were just, nobody was complaining. Everybody, I mean, even though we were doing 20 hour days, no one was complaining. And um, so that's what I remember about the cast. I just remember being kind of struck by how um, kind of generous that Jonathan was. And he made a point of going up to everybody and shaking their hands and welcoming them and being just so nice. And I just remember being struck by that because I had not seen that kind of behavior, um, you know, that kind of like like mayor of the town behavior on usually on any sets. People will be friendly. They'll be nice. But they're not like, hey, how are you? And what's your name? And it's, thank you so much for coming here. And it's great to see you. And I'm really happy you're part of this. That kind of stuff. You don't see that that much. Yeah, I've heard stories about Jonathan and, and uh, Brent Spiner, among other actors, you know, some of the uh-huh. leads who would go to the commissary yeah. on lunchtime with the character actors like yourself and actually hang out with them, which is kind of, I imagine, very odd as well. Yeah, I, and the the thing is, too, is that you have to go to the Paramount. They sh- shot it at Paramount, and you had to go to the Paramount commissary. They didn't bring you food. And so you go to the Paramount commissary, and there's, like, all these people there with Star Trek heads. <laughs> and at first you think, oh, my God, are they going to be wa- looking at me? And they didn't. They could have cared less. Like, we see this every day, <laughs> you know. But that was pretty funny. Now, I've heard typically that the set of Star Trek is usually pretty happy, pretty upbeat. But again, this episode being such a difficult one to shoot, how was the morale? I think people were really super tired. I mean, I know I was. I could barely even stand up by the end because, you know, when you go, I think I got sick for two weeks after because when you go a week and you're working, you know, literally from three in the morning until midnight and then you drive home and you get one hour of sleep and you have to go back and you can't sleep in the, in the, you know, in this horrible makeup, this crazy, you know, because they, you don't want to ruin your face. And, um, so I think people were just a little bit burned out. No one was, I didn't find anyone was kind of snappy or anything, but I felt like people just looked fatigued. The character you played, because we haven't even mentioned her name yet, that was Tana. And uh, right. the script itself, you know, to me, it was very much like a Rashomon style story, but with uh-huh. the Star Trek techno babble kind of twist. Uh, when right. you first read it, what did you think about the story? Um, it's kind of like all Star Trek stories where you kind of have to go, OK, well, what's the universe? What am I doing and what is the thing? And, you know, it was interesting. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was really interesting, but it was, you know, you got to wrap your head around it. It's kind of like when the, you get the story, it's not like, oh, you know, you're a mom that's upset because her kid got her kid ran out of her teacher of the kid hit the kid or something like that. It's not anything like that. It's like, OK, well, we're going to this planet and this is this thing and this is and there's all this like kind of 
millions of spokes going into the center of the wheel. So you just have to kind of figure out what you're doing. And, um, you know, uh, and like I said, Cliff was, I guess, because of all the technical issues and technical problems and green screens and everything else they were doing, that he was mainly concerned about all the technical stuff. And, you know, we were given direction, but not a lot, because it was mainly just about hitting the mark at the right time and getting this and making sure everybody could be seen and that kind of thing. So it was, um, you know, I mean, sometimes directors don't give you direction because they're happy with how you're doing it. And other times directors give you too much direction, you know, so. Yeah. So when the episode first right. aired, it was met with a pretty fair amount of criticism. And even since then, uh, some of the folks who were responsible for the episode called it one of the worst, if not the worst of the third uh, of the third season. And not because yeah. of the actors or anything that was done, just because of how the story worked out and all of that. Did you watch the episode when it first aired? And what did you think about it the first time you saw it? I did what I think I did watch it when it first aired. I thought it looked actually because I was on the set seeing all the, you know, you're acting and you see you have green screens here and all this. I kind of I liked it, but I was kind of looking at it probably from a different viewpoint that a Star Trek fan would look at it. Um, so I was just trying to see, does the story work? Does it, you know, how does it kind of how how are they doing all this like? replay stuff and all this all the things that they did so but it was a long time ago so to be a hundred percent honest i'm not a hundred percent sure exactly what i re how i reacted when it mm. came out i mean having, i just watched it for the first time and i don't even know how long but i was doing research for this interview and you know like i thought the performances were great i thought the sets looked really nice as well i thought the ending was a little flat for me a little techno right. babbly but i thought it was a good episode so i was actually kind of shocked to hear it wasn't as well received as i thought it would have been yeah, I yeah I didn't know that until now, so that's kind of interesting to hear. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I you know yeah, it is interesting to hear that. I feel horrible. I'm like the person that just broke the news to you, but. Uh... <laughs> oh no, it's okay. I, I'm not taking it personally. Trust me. I just think it's interesting because you know I don't. I've done other things, movies, whatever that are just huge bombs, and I don't mind that. I mean, that's just it's just you never know how something's going to turn out. So, um, but. Uh, you know, it was kind of hard to see how it was going to turn out, to be honest with you, when I was on the set, because it was just like these endless hours. And you're just like, when is this going to be over? And why do they have to reshoot this 100 times? I think it's it's actually pretty good, for, in my personal opinion. I think there's far, far worse episodes that should be panned but aren't. But that's a story for another day. So I do want to ask you also about your next appearance in Star Trek, and that would be in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And you were in the season three episode profit motive and that time around you were a character that looks like you had a lot more prosthetics going on so can you talk to us about what you had to wear for that part and uh was it better or worse than what you had to do for next gen i liked it better because i got to play kind of a weird looking you know chick and um so it was a more for me it was a the character was much more fun i don't know if it had to do with the fact that renee aubergenois the director who unfortunately I think he just passed away. Yeah, just passed away not long ago. Yeah. He was he's an actor, as you know. Because of that, he wanted to do uh rehearsals, which is unheard of in television. And um so we went and I think we did like three rehearsals. So which was great because that meant when we went to shoot Bing, bam, boom. Everything was already figured out, done, no problems. You know, we got it. I mean, it was just, so it was like, for me, it was a thousand times better an experience because, because we got to rehearse and because he got to say, well, let's try this, let's try that. And, you know, you got to really kind of find your character. And that was great. And Armin Shiverman is amazing. And um, he is such a generous actor. And he told us the story how during the earthquake he had on that, he had on his, face hmm. and he was really worried about his wife because you know where it happened i don't know where the earthquake happened at that time at northridge maybe or something and he ran out you know because the whole everything was happening and he jumped in his car he said and he said like almost 10 people got in car accidents because <laughs> he's driving <laughs> he's driving with his with his you know that character's head and you can't that those prosthetics they make you, you have to actually go get a mold of your head and your face and they give you a straw to breathe out of while they're putting the mold because you have to sit there for an hour while it dries. 
and then they make all your prosthetics on that. Once you get one made, you don't have to go back and do it again. So because I had done the one for the earlier, I didn't have to go back and do it for the second one. But um, but they put it on your face with uh, this, I guess it's the, some sort of glue. So you can't, if you were gonna just try to rip it off, you'd literally rip your skin off. So they have to, when they take it off, they have to use a teeny tiny little like um, paintbrush, all these paintbrushes and just dip it in the solution and ever so gently like kind of put it put the the liquid in your in your head till it slowly 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 starts to come off till you know everything's off so but that was a really fun that was a really fun working experience on deep space 9 because um it was just really fun to work with um Renee and it was really fun to work with Armin and it was just you know um and it was very very you can never say a Star Trek episode is fast. No. But for a Star Trek episode, that was fast. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, you're there for a few days, but you only have, you know, 15-hour days. You don't have 20-hour days um, or 10-hour tw- days. And that's kind of how it was. And I felt like maybe had uh, Renee not had that rehearsal, we could have been there for, like, a lot longer. Yeah, I don't know if you're aware of This is actually Renee's uh, first time in the director's chair. Do you know that back then? Yeah, I did. I did. And I thought that that was maybe why he was um, wanting to do a rehearsal. But it was a, it's an actually, it's a fantastic idea. I don't know why all television shows don't do that because they would save so much time and money to figure out it. Because we were actually on the set, doing the rehearsal on the set, you know, in our street clothes. So it would save so much time and money to have everything figured out before you actually have an entire crew sitting there you know, so, I mean, maybe, maybe our hours were like eight hours on that or nine hours. It wasn't long. The, the shoot days were not long on that. It was, I just remember it. And most of it was getting in and out of prosthetics. And you mentioned that you guys did rehearsals for this episode. So I imagine that Renee was much more of an actor's director, as opposed to somebody yes. who's more focused on yes. being a director's director for themselves. Uh, yes. How would you describe how he directed well, he was great and he was really into making sure every beat and every, you know, he was just, he was just like working with an actor, you know, he just, he knew about in- intentions. He knew about, you know, if he asked you to do something, he wouldn't say, oh, say this line fast. Or he would say, oh, you're really excited here. So, you know, he would direct you like that. So it was not, you know, it's just not like a lot of directors will say, oh, could you just speed it up there? You can. And it, looks fine but you know it's a lot different when somebody says you know and on this part you know you might be speeding up because you're so excited you have to get this and that's kind of how he talked to people so he was he was wonderful and he was a really really wonderful actor he's one of the guys i wish i could have actually met uh but i never got a chance to meet him get an autograph or just say hello so unfortunately that's passed for me but i'm glad you got to work with him and i'm happy here that was such a good experience as well yeah it was so you mentioned Armin Shearman already, uh, and your scene mm-hmm. was directly with him because you, right. when scene we first meet you, you're giving umox to Quark. You're rubbing right. his ears. <laughs> right, uh, right. I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, just walk us through that scene, and I'm curious if you were worried about accidentally pulling off Quark's ears during that. Not really, because, you know, it's on there with glue, so it's <laughs> not going to come off. But because we had the um, we had the rehearsal and because, you know, it was just, I mean, I came up with the movements I was doing on the ears myself, um, but he was... Armin is such a responsive actor that the minute, like you, you could almost be touching his ears and he'd be reacting. So it wasn't like I had to go really hard on his ears for him to, to feel it or react or whatever. So, but yeah, he's, he's a, he's a great guy. And I hear now some friends of mine tell me that he's like considered one of the best acting teachers in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Now also in this episode, uh, Wallace Shawn is a guest star and the uh-huh. scene you're in, I know there's a stand-in for when the character of the Grand Nagus walks in, but were you able to actually meet Wallace Shawn at all during the, the uh, filming of this I episode? I saw him there, but I didn't meet him, no, because they had just the stand-in. I think they were trying to respect his not taking up too much of his time. So, um, But I did see him come in. But I think he was in makeup when they were doing that part. So aside from giving Quark some umox, which sounds horribly dirty, you also did a scene where Quark gets to meet the Prophets, and they called you back in to be one of the voices of the Prophets, essentially. Uh, what do you recall about how they filmed those scenes and what your role was for that? That one, it, okay, I don't, like, my memory of that episode, 99, 90, 80% of it is that scene I had with Armin. The other stuff felt like the typical Star Trek thing where you come in and you, you know, you're, 
you hit a mark and that kind of thing. So for me, that was not as fun as doing the one with Armin. The one with Armin was, you know, great and fun. And that was the one we rehearsed. Okay. He didn't rehearse the other one. So aside from DS9, TNG, you have one other very curious Star Trek credit to your resume. And that was when you appeared in the 1996 interactive video game, Star Trek Borg. Uh, you Correct. played Lieutenant Shorm. Uh, so just tell us a little bit about being in this really bizarre point and click kind of movie video game and what that experience was like. Well, that was weird. And that was the kiss of death for me because I was a, I, I didn't have makeup. I wasn't an alien. So that was the end of, that was the end of Star Trek for me. But um, uh, it was a little bit strange because it was before people were doing lots and lots of video games. So they didn't really have video games at the time. And I remember they gave a call to casting director, called my agent and asked if I would be, be willing to do this. The money was terrible. Huh. I think like, you know, $200 for it. And, um, you know, and then you had to pay the agent, the taxes, you made like 50 bucks for two days, you know, for <laughs> a week's work. I mean, it was terrible because they didn't have any, they didn't have any, contracts at that time for you know because they weren't doing video games of what you know a star trek so it felt kind of like a i was doing a favor um with that job um it was fine it was kind of you know it was kind of a little bit not defined so we were told okay you come in here you come in there you know we were given things to do and um but it wasn't kind of the same as doing a show you know and uh and also, I had no idea it was even going to be, I thought it was just some test they were doing for something they were thinking they were doing. I had no idea it was like a, you know, it was actual, an actual video game until many years later. Yeah, it was pretty unique for the time. Uh, and this is when point and click first person games are starting to show up. Right. Uh, and, and basically the camera is the avatar for the player. Uh, it's right. very bizarre. I mean, did you ever see the final product or play it? I've seen, no, I haven't. I haven't played it. I've recommend seen, it. <laughs> I've seen, yeah, I just, I mean, it, the whole thing was weird because we didn't know everybody was there kind of as a favor. And, you know, I remember none of us were really making any money. And it was like not the kind of thing that you would be like, okay, well, I'll make residuals. You weren't making any residuals either. So, um, and it was kind of like not defined, like what we were doing. You know, I think they just called people that they liked and asked, will you do this? So that was your time on Star Trek shows, but obviously your career continues, and you've been on so many other things that I've, I'm sure I've seen you in, in fact. Uh, you've been in shows like Major Dad, Monk. Uh, you were actually, in fact, on the pilot episode of Babylon 5. You've been in Seventh Heaven, John Larroquette show, uh, many, many other things. But I think the one I want to actually ask you about right now, uh, because this is probably the first time I've gotten to ask about him, but you were in Walker, Texas Ranger. You were in Season right. 9. Right, with Chuck Norris. Yeah, you, you were played uh, D.A. Christy Clark in the episode Deadly Situation. Uh, what can right. you tell us about Beyond on Walker? Well, I played the best friend of, um, why can't I think of her name? The um, love interest of, um, why can't I think of her name? Oh, anyway, uh, Sherry Wilson? Sherry Wilson, thank you. Or Sher is it Sheree Wilson? Or, uh, Sherry, yeah, Sherry yeah. Wilson, yeah. Um, and... Um, it was kind of interesting. I mean, you know, I got a call. I auditioned for it. I got a call. You got it. They shot it in Dallas. They had stand-in for Chuck um, Chuck Norris the whole time. And then at the very end, very, very, very end, when they knew it was going to be the, the shot they were going to shoot, they brought him in. So I didn't get a lot of time to, you know, hang out with them. Cherie Wilson, she was very nice. But at the time, she was doing, I think she had been on that show for years, and she was kind of getting bored, and she was doing some makeup or skin line or skincare line or something like that. And she was on the phone all the time for that. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a little bit, and then I just remember, I'm a vegetarian. I just remember going out to eat there and in Texas, you got to eat steak. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's what it's about, you know? And I remember going out with ca some cast members and they were like, get these steaks that were literally the size of, I mean, I've never seen steaks this big, like, you know, 24 inches long and you know 12 30, 20 inches like so big and um they looked at me like i was crazy when i was just going okay i'll just have a potato and you know <laughs> salad but it was nice I and mean, the people on the show were very very like a lot of locals a lot of um super down-to-earth people and not hollywood at all which was kind of nice to be there hmm. and also i think um his son directed me.
And how was that being directed by his son? That must be pretty unique. Yeah, that was, that was Eric yeah. Norris, in fact. Yes, yeah, so you're yeah. right about that. And he was a nice guy. And it was kind of, you know, it just felt like, to be honest with you, it felt like a set that I think they had been running it for years. And it felt like almost like a set that was bored. They were just showing up for, you know, let's just get through this. Didn't seem like it didn't have the same energy, like, for example, with Rene when I was doing Star Trek, that he was so excited about the episode and the people were so excited it was more like okay here we go again now we got to do this scene now we got to do this scene and that's kind of how everybody was you know where's the paycheck and let's just get this done the people there were very very nice but it was just it felt like one of those shows that have been running for years and they just had their you know their way they did things and um and it was just like okay we're coming to work we're doing this blah 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 we're going home it didn't they didn't make it into a big deal which was kind of nice. So another show that you were on that I think a lot of our listeners enjoy uh, was The X-Files. You did an episode of that, and that seemed like a pretty yes. fun episode also. You got to be uh, Nancy Klein in the episode Arcadia. What do you remember about The X-Files? Oh, um, that was fun um, because I got to get killed. Yep. And um, so I got to scream, so that's always fun. And um, I just remember being in Simi Valley, which is the like middle of nowhere in Cal- Los Angeles area out in the valley, and for hours and hours and hours and hours because it took forever to do that. It took forever. So, but um, as far as working on it, it was really fun. Was that your first on-screen death? And um, I think I did like a oh, let me see. I think I did a horror movie when I was younger um, that I can't remember that I think I died in that. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of any other on-screen deaths and I can't, I probably have to look at my resume and see, but you know, oh no, I did, I did get killed. I did a TV movie. Um, I did a TV movie about Satanists and that was around the time I was doing the law and Harry McGraw and it was called like ninth floor or 39th floor or something. It had some name like that where oh, yeah, everybody nightmare on the 13th floor. Yep. Nightmare on the 13th floor. Thank you. And, um, I got killed in that. And that was the funniest story about that was when I did the audition, um, you know, they wanted you to audition for the, with the death scene. And so, you know, I've, screamed and then somebody in the office next door said shut up (laughs) and I thought that was pretty hilarious um but yeah I got killed in that too (laughs) that was with um that was with Nurse Ratchet that show Louise Fletcher that's right and and Louise uh Louise Fletcher was also uh Kai Wynn on Star Trek D Space Nine as well right 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 how did you enjoy working with her she was fantastic she has I think she has a depth or she was raised by deaf parents or something. I don't know, but she's lived in the Washington DC area, which, you know, was really interesting for me. Um, and so she just flew in, did the job and flew back to DC. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I think we can't finish this interview without discussing a little bit of your time on NYPD blue as well. Uh, since you were a recurring character there, uh, do you have any right. NYPD blue stories for us? Well, um, I had the pleasure of working with Dennis Franz, who is, amazing and um he's as nice to you know the janitor on the set as he is to somebody who's famous he's just amazing and um i did a bunch of botchko shows and um that show was done by i can't remember the name of the guy who was um david milch and david milch was brilliant or is brilliant but crazy (laughs) and um so he would they, you know, got the script to me. I auditioned, but then they got the script to me, the final script at like, I don't know, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And I had a 6 a.m. call. So it was kind of nerve wracking to read it and think, OK, I'll get up at four and, you know, just try to. And you get to the set and you learn all your lines and you have all these things and you're working with this dentist who's great, but he's famous and everything else. And you get to the set and then David Milch runs in and says, you know, here's the new, here's the new script. And he hands you a script of seven pages with all new words. And, um, and, uh, I was like, what the hell? And Dennis said, Oh, welcome to the show. Apparently, you know, Dennis was not, nothing phased him. And, um, but I guess, I think, um, Jimmy Smith couldn't take it working with Milch 
And um, so he he wanted off the show, but he was brilliant. He made a really brilliant character for me. He really had a lot he wanted to do with the character. He really wanted to take it a long way. But what happened after I did a couple of episodes or maybe the first episode, David decided to go and work on, I guess, whatever his next show was. And um, because of that, they did not know what to do with my character. So um, they had this whole plan that I was going to be the new love interest for Dennis. And then they were, you know, they were like, not sure what to do. And then Dennis got really angry because they had his character have sex with me and then want to break up with me afterwards. And he thought that was really awful. And but I think they just didn't know what. David had this whole idea of who I was and told me this whole long story of, you know, you're in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh and you're living with your mother and you're this, he had this whole thing of what the character was and he left and that my character was David's vision and not Bochco's vision and not anybody else's. So unfortunately I just did, I think like five episodes and I probably would have been a regular had David remained on the, you know, remained with the show. All right. So, Juliana, let's do a little quick best and worst here. What was the best experience you had on a set ever versus the worst experience? I guess the Muppets Take Manhattan is the best. And the worst was um, a TV show that nobody knows about called, um, it was a Superboy. I do remember Superboy, actually. You're like one of about probably 10 people that remember Superboy. But anyway. I don't think I should be proud of that, but I do remember it. Oh, good. I did an episode of Superboy and... um, I just, I think Jackie Coogan was directing and he was not a really nice person. So that was probably, you know, it's hard to say the worst experience because it's never so bad to go on a set and be, you know, given a trailer and all that stuff. It's all nice and it's all, you know, relative compared to some people that have to like, you know, work at a grocery store or something and be on their feet all day. So I feel like I shouldn't say anything was bad, but um, I think I've had more difficult experiences with commercials where, you know, you're in situations where you're in the heat or wet or whatever. So acting jobs always been pretty much okay. But I just remember, I think it was Jackie Coogan Coogan that I worked with. And I remember him not being, I don't know what he was going through personally, but him being extremely difficult to um, work with. And uh, so that was and I say the Muppets because it's the easiest for me to remember, but I had a lot of other really good experiences like on the Gambler Returns. That was really, those people were all great and um, with Kenny Rogers and um, other things. But uh, but for the most part, when you do a job, it's like, you know, everybody's happy because they are working and they're getting paid. And they know a lot of people are not working and not getting paid. So for the most part, people are just really in good moods. So, um, so it's usually pleasant on sets. Let's try another one here. How about the best experience you had acting with another actor face to face? The best rapport you had, maybe we'll call it. Wow. I wish I had these questions before so I could really think about it. So, um, that's what we do here. We put people on the spot and Trek Untold. Yeah, (laughs) I know. I'm like, I'm like, oh, where? that's a hard one. Probably on screen, probably Dennis, Dennis Franz, because he was, it was so easy to, um, it was that my character was really in love with him and it was, he made my, it, he made me it easier for me because he was so sweet that, you know, I could like feel like I could be in love with him. Um, so that was, you know, that's up there. I'm trying to think of, you know, other films or whatever but yeah probably i'd say dennis dennis franz what is the best piece of acting advice that another actor gave you that you've held on to to this day there's a saying that they always use in acting classes and in other things called kiss keep it simple stupid so i guess the best advice is to keep it simple stupid um because sometimes you you know, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, you know, you have to understand that the audience imbues a lot of things going on inside of you. So as long as you can just, you know, be real and keep it simple, then I think that's the best advice. I think when, you know, um, 
when people try to do too much, that's when it becomes a problem. So looking forward now, as we're doing this interview, we are, of course, neck deep in the COVID outbreak still in this pandemic. Right. But uh, what else has Juliana Donald been working on lately? Or what are you looking forward to working back on once things restart? Okay, well, I was actually took kind of a segue and started a, a jewelry company. And um, I've been working on that a lot. I uh, did what's it do called? A movie. It's called Eco and the Bird, uh, my middle name, uh, I-C-O, A-N, and then and the Bird. I have an Instagram account if people want to see it. And... Um, at Eco and the Bird, and um, I've been doing that. So I've been traveling a lot for that, and I've been focusing a lot on that. I did do some. I did do a couple of years ago. I did an episode of How to Get Away with Murder. I kind of, I kind of was in retirement, and I was doing my jewelry stuff. And then I, one of my friends talked me into getting some lady to send me on some auditions, and I got that. And then I got another job in a Hillary Swank movie, which should be coming out, um, this month or next month, called. I don't know how you pronounce this. F A T A L E. I don't know if it's fatal or fatale or what. I would go with fatal, maybe. Let's... Fatal, yeah. But that's the name of the movie. Um, so I haven't really. I have a manager that I just got, but um, my the agent that sent me on those few auditions, she quit, and is now a realtor in Nantucket. And so I haven't really pursued getting an agent, mainly because you know, who wants to go on a set and work when, um, when there's COVID. So, um, so that's basically what's going on. So I guess Fatal is coming out and, um, I'm kind of debating, I've had some like offers to do some movies, low budget movies, but I'm kind of debating because, um, it's, because I'm older now, it's like a lot more, uh, I just become to the point where, do I want to go on a million auditions and, you know, and um, spend all this time doing that or spend time doing something else? So I'm kind of like on, a little bit on the fence of, about acting at the moment. So, Well, I do hope that you find a lot of success with your jewelry company, this new venture you Thank have here. Uh, I actually would like so to hear much. a little bit more about that and how you pivoted into that part of uh well, basically, you know, someone who's gone into acting and someone who wanted to be a ballerina, now she's got a jewelry company. So how does how does that come about? Um, basically, I was kind of, um, it was kind of, I don't know, uh, my agent of 25 years said she, my commercial agent of 25 years, who was like my friend, said she couldn't take it anymore and she was going to go be a kindergarten teacher. And then my regular agents of a million years were all at that point like in their 80s and 90s and they decided to quit because they were old and there was one young agent there that said he wanted to work with me and he took me to another agency called the Mark Bass Agency. They sent me on a couple of auditions. I got an offer to do some TV show which ended up not happening, but shortly thereafter he was thrown in jail for stealing all the actors' money. Uh -huh. Then the other agent from there said, well, I'm going to be a manager and I'll represent you. And then he got fatal cancer, some type of fatal cancer. He wasn't even old. And then after that, I thought, you know, maybe I'm getting a sign from the universe that, you know, maybe I'm getting a sign from the universe that I should maybe think about doing something else. So I started, I still kind of, when I got auditions, I still went on them and I started going to take a bunch of different graduate school classes. And I took business and you know interior design and all these different courses psychology and you know everything else and just because I was so burned out by um, the you know statistics classes and everything else I thought I'll just take a beating class to de-stress and I went to take a beating class and I sat next to a like the nuclear physicist which you know and I was like what are you doing here and he goes well you know this is like I'm obsessed with stones and I kind of started getting interested and I took a couple classes and um, the minute you look into a stone in a microscope you realize there's this amazing universe inside of this stone it feels like you're in a different like a different generation like a you know you're in space or something and I just kind of got really fascinated with it and so I became a gemologist I got a graduate gemology degree and then I thought I was still acting and then I thought well I have to you know I want to do so I have to be creative so then I took started taking design classes and before I knew it 
I was designing jewelry. So that's how I got into it. So it's kind of like a crazy, you know, thing, but, uh, it's very different than acting. It's much harder in a way because in acting you have like your parents, which are your agent is your, you know, your agent is your mother SAG. The union is your father. And, you know, everybody takes care of you and they tell you where, okay, here's your audition and go on this audition and then you get a job and we're going to get you the money and then we're going to send you the money. And it's like you're a little baby being told, like, you know, you don't have to think about anything. You just, all you have to do is think about showing up, doing your audition, hopefully getting the job and, you know, moving on. And um, all of a sudden I was in this career where I had to be the mother, father and everything. You know, I had to. I had to make all the decisions. I had to like, you know, do the designs. I had to figure out all the financials. I had to, and I didn't have anybody saying, oh, this is how much, this is what the union charges. This is what, so it's, you know, and it's crazy to start thinking about, okay, well, if this costs me this much money, what do I charge for making it for all my time and everything else? So it became like a real challenge. So, and it's not something people really need, but, um, I really enjoy doing it because um, I travel a lot to India and I love it there. And um, so I just, you know, find it, um, it's a very different than, very different than acting, which, you know, feels like um, the easy days for me compared to this. Yeah, I'm actually, thanks to the magic of the internet, I'm able to look at it while we're chatting. I'm on ecoandtheverd.com. Yes. And, uh, you know, some real stunning, breathtaking pieces here, oh, uh, you know, especially the uh, Ron Deny collection. I'm, it's really yeah. gorgeous stuff there. Thank you. Thank you. It seems like a lot um, of your pieces are, are very inspired by nature and kind of the simple beauty of nature. Uh, what's yes. your philosophy on creating these pieces? I really love stones and I wanted to do stuff that was um, that was not... I wanted to do stuff that kind of told a story because that's my background. That's with acting and my dance and everything. It was always telling a story. And so not just something pretty, but something that meant something. And I was kind of, I am super inspired by nature as most people are, but I try to kind of figure out something in there that can tell a story. So it's, um, you know, and I went to, I went to Myanmar um, Yangon, uh, a year ago. And I did a collection with a bunch of goldsmiths there. Um, and that was based on the, um, Burmese Zodiac, which if you go there, if you go to Shui Dagon Pagoda, which is the giant, the biggest Buddhist temple in the world, they, when you walk in there, 5,000 people just hit you with like, what day are you born on? And because they believe in, in Burma and there's this, their astrology is based on the day of the week you were born. So, um, so they, at the temple there, um, even though there's thousands of Buddhists, they're all Buddhist, um, statues, they're all divided into these seven days of the week. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go there and, um, think of a wish and take the ladle of water next to it and ladle as many ladles as you are born. So depending on your age, you're ladling that, thinking of your wish the whole time and they believe it will come true. So I thought that would be a fun thing to do, but it's, I think it's a little bit more esoteric. So that's the only one I've done that way. Most of the stuff I, I, and that was partially because I was in Myanmar and I wanted to do something that was indicative of the, like representative of the country. Oh, it's all very, very beautiful stuff here. I recommend any jewelry lovers out there who are listening, check it out, egoandthebird.com. Thank you. So, Juliana, last question about Star Trek mm -hmm. for this interview here today, uh, and that's what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? You're like a family, you know? I mean, it's just, like, so amazing. It's so amazing that there's all these fans and that I have, you know, like... I remember when I was still acting full time and I went to an audition and this guy was like, thank God you're here. And I thought, okay, he thinks I'm somebody else, you know, cause I, I don't know who he is. He was just the guy putting people on tape. And then, you know, we put on tape and he goes, I'm so glad you're here. And I was like, uh, do you know, you know, do you know who I am? I, I just don't. And then he goes, no, you're the only person I haven't got the signature from, from uh, the next generation. And he pulled out this huge, huge volume with a million people's pictures in there. And uh, he got right to mine and said, can you sign it? And I thought that was kind of amazing and, you know, unexpected. So I think it's great. I think it's, you know, um, I think it's great that they, they created this thing that is so, uh, you know, 
creative and different and amazing and that it's amazing that you're a part of the family. I think the whole thing is, you know, really, really wonderful. Well, I'm glad you got to share in that experience and be part of the Star Trek family. Yes, me too. Me too. All right. So yeah, Juliana, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and chat all about your various things throughout your career, Star Trek and everything else. And uh, I wish you much luck and success with Eco and the Bird as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was our chat with Juliana Donald, who has really done some amazing work and had the opportunity to work with so many talented people. I'm very grateful we got to spend some time with her today and hear about some of these experiences. Besides, how often do I get to speak with someone who hung out with both Kermit the Frog and Captain Picard? That's pretty rare. And quite frankly, that's pretty awesome. If you want to check out more of Juliana's jewelry, head over to icoandthebird.com. It really is worth taking a look to see why I was gushing so much during this interview about it. I guarantee any Ferengi would sell his Moogie to get a hold of some of that jewelry. If you watched the episode A Matter of Perspective to prepare for this week's episode, the science station may look familiar to you. That's because that set was a reuse of the one from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan on Regula 1. That set from The Wrath of Khan was in fact also a reuse from an office complex from the first Star Trek movie. And not surprisingly, that same set will be used again a few more times on Deep Space Nine. As for the DS9 episode we talked about today, one of the big challenges was that scene with the Prophets. This was the first time it had been done since the pilot, I believe, and it was originally created by director David Carson and director of photography Marvin Rush. In order to achieve that very unique look to the scene with the Prophets, the DP for this particular episode overexposed the images and used diffusion filters to give it that blurry, ethereal look that we've all come to know and love. As far as Star Trek episodes go, that one is probably one of the furthest removed from a typical Star Trek episode and was treated more as a comedy. In fact, with Renee directing it, you'll see there's actually a lot of allusions to famous old comedies, including one or two scenes that are practically lifted right out of a Marx Brothers movie. So if you haven't seen that episode again in a while, I recommend checking it out if you want a good laugh. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this show, and if you can, leave a review and rating. We would appreciate it very much if you did. You can also follow us on social media. Just look for Trek Untold on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you there. And of course, we'd like to hear your thoughts about this week's episode. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can check out patreon.com slash trekuntold to learn how you can keep our ship operating at full power. And you can also check out some of our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash trekuntold. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. And shout out to Scott Ray for setting up this interview. If you'd like to book this week's guest for a convention appearance or an autograph signing event, email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. This has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and until next time, fortune favors the bold.